Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Open Belgium. I want to quickly thank our three main sponsors, Mono Design, Microsoft, and Agentschap Binnenlands Bestuur, for making this possible. And now, without further ado, I want to give the floor to Raf. Thank you for the uh, introduction, Astrid. Good morning, and all a warm welcome in our session about personal data governance which of course is crucial in the context of a fair data economy. I'm Rolf Berle, I'm working at the Digital Flanders Agency. I'm also a member of the board of Open Knowledge Belgium. Now, I would like to introduce you to Harry van der Velde. Harry is a stunning visual harvester who will capture our thoughts and visualize the core ideas about personal data governance on the whiteboard, which Christophe will share via the chat. Also, I would like to uh, introduce Christophe Kopp. Christophe has a background in neurobehavioral sciences, statistics, and data science. And actually, he was the founder and curator of TEDx Flanders, co-founded by the Belgian Pirate Party. Since January, this year, he actually he joined Kronos to set up a company around solid consulting to accelerate to accelerate this paradigm about putting citizens in control of their data and making this uh, paradigm shift a reality. Christophe, the floor is yours. Hello, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Raf, uh, for introducing me. Um, I will uh, briefly give the introduction of today uh, on what's on the agenda and what we're going to talk about, and uh, then I'll uh, hand over the floor back to Raf later. I will now share my screen, and I hope everything uh, works well. Um, voila. Um, just a second. Okay. Voila. So today uh, is actually the topic is on towards a data trust. And uh, this is the agenda, uh, but we will see this later as well. So I'll start the presentation uh, now. First, we need to know indeed what we are talking about. So I will explain the broad scope of uh, what uh, the implications are and, and why we are talking about a person-centric uh, ecosystem and um, how to get citizens in control of their data. Then we will zoom in on this possible new ecosystem. And within that ecosystem, we will talk today about the data cooperative or the data trust within the ecosystem. Uh, for that data uh, trust, we will discuss four uh, major, uh, let's say, uh, aspects or key aspects. We will talk about the business, the legal, the technological, and the organizational aspects uh, that are important to start such a cooperative. During uh, my presentation, you will find some working definitions, and they are indicated by the orange um, diamond. The broad scope. So the internet uh, is quite uh, an unregulated space. Well, uh, at least what WWW and the internet are. Uh, and that means that we don't have an actual governance layer. Currently, we are more in a platform model where uh, big companies, the GAFAM, uh, actually has most access to our data where we think that uh, just like the my data model a user centric uh, version of internet is needed and this is what we want to achieve roughly speaking there are three well two existing paradigms and we want to introduce a possible third one so the first paradigm is that uh, what i call the american uh, paradigm where big corporations have control over personal data and much other data as well. The second paradigm, uh, we should call it the Chinese model, where uh, data is mostly in control by the government. And then there might be a third uh, model for which there is already some legislation uh, in Europe where we think, okay, a user-centric model of data 
uh, would be appropriate. And it is this paradigm where we'll be, be thinking in today. Within this paradigm, there is a whole possible ecosystem. One, the persons, of course, who have the data, have access to their data and give, can give uh, access to other people and other companies. There will be applications which uh, show the visualizations and the insights coming from that data. There are companies using that data as well. They can uh, reprocess it and get insights for themselves. Of course, there will be regulations uh, on the data traffic regulation, the data request rules, and actions against violations of uh, data traffic done by governments. There will be uh, a need for pod providers where that data is stored and handled carefully and securely. And then, of course, there will be companies that are app developers. There might still also appear unknown roles and new players to this emerging field uh, as this paradigm takes shape. Today, we focus on the data intermediaries and more specifically, the data intermediaries organized by people and for people, the data trust or data cooperative. A data cooperative uh, system within the ecosystem. So what should we think about? How can we uh, make an organization for the people, by people, who unite and share their data amongst themselves so that it can be processed and valuable insights can be shared. And then this indeed holds four different aspects, business-wise, legal, technological, and organizational. On the business side, we have the data trust. A data trust is a group or entity that indeed takes a steward stewarding of the data. Why? Because of course, you just like you don't like uh, to click away cookies or to uh, fill out all the access sharing uh, requests that you get when you visit the website. You don't want to uh, has, have that as a burden uh, during your day. So you want to delegate it to um, a, a company or an organization and why not a corporate? As they act as a data fiduciary, that means that as an organization, you determine the purpose and means of processing of that personal data and sharing. Some roles that the business uh, will probably need to take and which can we discuss today is indeed data hosting, data processing, sharing, gathering, and that uh, in a data collaborative uh, as a data intermediary. There are, of course, already uh, people and organizations like mydata.org who have uh, thought about different data stewardship models. So it is indeed also part of the exercise today to think which data stewardship model do we opt or which do we think is best fitted uh, for a collective of people who bring their data together. Legal aspects, while the Data Governance Act, while not in effect uh, already, it is under construction. And indeed, they provide uh, legislation for these data sharing intermediaries uh, to take place. So which aspects should we take into account from that side? And finally, uh, these, which legal entity do we need to found or construct? Uh, these are just uh, the Belgian ones that we can uh, get, that we can use to, to have a, a legal entity. But of course, uh, there is always the option to choose for others as well. Some technical aspects, as people will be sharing data amongst themselves and aggregate data, that means that there will be uh, at least a temporary space where this data gets stored and processed so that the insights can be shared or sold or uh, in other ways uh, used by uh, our data trust. So um, the question is, how should we organize this to avoid against centralization that all the data gets stored together uh, by the corporation or by the organization that we found, but still that it is possible that we have all this data processing going on. On a technical level as well, so there will be roughly two types of data that will be uh, resulting from the data processing. First, of course, is the general insights that come on a population level where you aggregate information. 
and get real insights on a group level uh, or on a let's say consumer group level that then can be either uh, kept as IP or can be sold or marketed. On the other side, you have uh, derived personal information. For example, from your clicking behavior, you might have an estimation of your personality profile, which of course need to be stored again on your own data space. Another thing to consider is the consent profiles as some data you wish to share freely amongst everybody whilst others are highly confidential and probably need more restrictions and access management. Given that we have an organization that wants to be collaborative and cooperative, the organization structure should be flat and aspects of decision making, uh, of consensus decision making, include participation, egalitarianism, inclusion, collaboration and cooperation. And then, of course, we should also ask the question, what are the roles of the members who wish to participate in this cooperative? And what do they want to contribute, need to contribute, should contribute, uh, and what could they get back in return uh, as insights, as gain benefits? Uh, would it be monetary? Will it be uh, services? Or would it be uh, just, let's say, basic insights? So these are, uh, this is for setting the stage uh, of today. Uh, I hope this is a little bit clear and I will now give back the word to Raf. Thank you, Christophe, for this uh, introduction and, and giving us an insight in the broader domain of personal data governance. Now, um, I would like to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Vivi. Uh, Vivi is a data policy fellow at the World Economic Forum. Also, she's a special advisor in data policy at the city of Helsinki, researcher at University of Helsinki and Aalto University, and also senior advisor at My Data Global. Vivi, thank you um, for joining us, and we're looking forward to your insights about personal data governance. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Raf, for the for the introduction. Um, I indeed wear many, many hats, and I am here uh, mainly with my my data hat on. And um, I I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the 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 Data Governance Act, um, which is currently <clears throat> being prepared in the European Union. Um, I had the pleasure yesterday of, of being um, being heard by the ITRA committee of the European Parliament on the Data Governance Act. So I'm going to share some of the some of the thoughts um, uh, with you that I also shared with the uh, with the members of the Parliament and uh, the ITRA committee yesterday. So let me just um, pull up my screen and. Share that. Um, okay, so um, that's me. Hi. Uh, so here with my My Data Global hat on, senior senior ad advisor. I've been around My Data for several years um, with with different roles, um, and uh, but at the moment, I'm uh, I'm providing um, advice mainly on on kind of uh, global and European um, and also Finnish level policy, um, as well as supporting the thought develop uh, thought leadership development at My Data Global. Um, so today I want to want to share a couple of thoughts about the EU Data Governance Act um, and my data operators um, as entities which are are being governed by or will be governed by this act. So first I'll just say a couple of words, general words about the Data Governance Act or the DGA. Uh, then about my data and my data operators. Um, then. Um, how these two connect as data sharing service providers in the DGA. Um, and finally, some uh, agenda points uh, that my data has for improving the DGA um, as it becomes um, law. So the Data Governance Act uh, was announced in the European Strategy for Data in February last year. 
as a legislative framework for the governance of common European data spaces. Um, it was proposed by the Commission in November and is currently being considered by the European Parliament and the European Council. And there are actually two versions that I've I've seen uh, at the moment. So there's the original proposal by the Commission and a version with proposed amendments um, or first version uh, with uh, proposed amendments by, by the Council. So I might refer to one or the other as I go along here. Um, so there are also very similar or similar sounding things happening um in in europe so i just wanted to make sure that we're talking about the same same thing so the data governance act is is one thing uh but it is not the digital services act uh which uh regulates online intermediary services in order to counter illegal goods services or content online and uh, there's also di the digital markets act which regulates large online platforms as gatekeepers and also in the data strategy of, of last year, um, there was the announcement of the Data Act 2021, um, but that's uh, something whose content we don't yet know. But the Data Governance Act uh, is um, is something other than these. And uh, I'll, go th I'll, I'll briefly describe what it contains in just a little bit. Um, so just, to make sure everyone is aware of, of what my data is all about as well, I wanted to show this slide. So the my data mission is uh, for a fair, sustainable and prosperous digital society through a human centric approach to personal data. And you can see the my data logo there in the middle with the person at the center and different sectors in which um, data about us gets amassed every day. So this digital society that my data works towards is one where people get value from their data and set the agenda on how it's used. And for organizations and companies, the ethical use of data is always the most attractive option. So this is what we're for. Um, my data global as an organization uh, is an international nonprofit. Uh, we're headquartered in Finland, founded, um, a little over two years ago. Um, membership includes uh, individual people as well as organizations from different sectors of society and from over 50 countries. My Data Global also has, uh, I think it's exactly 30 local hubs, yeah, on, 60, uh, on six continents, um, as well as international groups that are formed around specific themes, such as my data operators that uh, I'll be touching on next. Um, so my data operators are one way to think about um, data governance and um, providing infrastructure for data ecosystems. So my data operators are the kind of entities that connect the person with the ecosystem of data where data sources and data using services um, access and, and use and enrich and, and in general process the data about this person. So it's, it's pretty clear that in a system where one would have to control one's relationship to every single uh, data source or data using service, um, you know, my, my entire life would be all about managing those relationships. But oh, my data operators are um, data intermediaries that can help uh, manage that and help people exercise meaningful control over the data about them. Um, my data operators are the kinds of things that the Data Governance Act seeks to regulate um, as, as data intermediaries or, or as they're currently, uh, they're phrased, data sharing service providers. Um, there, we work with dozens of organizations um, who've gone through a process and uh, been awarded the My Data Operator 2020 Award. Uh, so these these are are real companies offering real services right now around the world um, and um, 
many of them also in Europe. So these are the kinds of things, um, and I'm realizing that I am running a little bit long here. So these are the kinds of things that um, operators, my data operators can do. Uh, not all of them do all of these things, but all of them do some of these things, but I won't go through uh, them in detail. So I promised to, to say a little bit about the DGA and its contents. So it's basically three different things. Um, the the beef of the the legislation is really in chapters two three and four and um our focus as my data global is is on chapter three requirements applicable to data sharing services um so these um serve uh, the the data sharing service providers uh have been defined in this um council amended version uh, as service providers which through the provision of technical legal and other services establish relationships between an undetermined number of data holders and data users for the exchange pooling or trade of data and they in the um Again, uh, I'll quote from the, the amended council version. Um, they're also described as um, making available the technical or other means uh, to, to enable uh, the exercise of the rights provided for in the GDPR. So data cooperatives, on the other hand, uh, are defined as something distinct from these data sharing service providers that I just described. So data cooperatives um, are uh, organizations that support data subjects or one person companies uh, who are members um, and who confer the power to the cooperative to negotiate terms and conditions for data processing before they consent. So these are the, the two, two different kinds of um, uh, entities that are, are envisioned in the DGA. And I'll really quickly go through some of the things that we at My Data Global have noticed that would make this, uh, this um, act um, even better. So these are um, the inclusion of rights holders in the definitions, a clear and wide scope um, of application of this act and some focused requirements like interoperability for data intermediaries. <coughs> um, <clears throat> sorry. So at the moment, uh, only data holders and data users um, and these data intermediaries are, are defined in the act. And as my data, we find it incredibly important, and also for the for harmonization with the GDPR, that the rights holders, the people themselves, um, are included. The clear and wide scope um, should be uh, pretty um, kind of. Uh, it's it's almost obvious to, to say that the, the the scope should be very, very clear and it should be set out in the articles of the act itself. Um, and the point about the wide scope is, is to really make sure that this act captures all actual relevant and foreseeable future um, data sharing activities um, that currently exist in the market, like the ones that we work with at My Data Global. And third, the focused requirements such as interoperability for these data intermediaries um, can serve the purpose of uh, keeping the, the playing field level for all kinds of actors so we don't end up with gatekeepers if we have functional interoperability requirements. Um, and this also provides for, for consumer choice. Um, So I'll conclude there. Um, these are the recommendations that My Data Global has. Um, we've gone through the, the act in, in quite a lot of detail and there's much more I could say about it. Um, but these, these are the key things that we feel um, could make the, the act even better than it currently is. 
So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So thank you, Vivi, for the insight as well as the recommendations, uh, which will, will be also discussed during uh, our panel discussion. Now, meanwhile, I'm very curious for um, what uh, Harry did with uh, our talks and how he captured them on the whiteboard. Christophe, can we quickly zoom in on the uh, on Harry's whiteboard? Yeah, just a second. I'll, I'll first uh, try and uh, present a, a little second. Sorry, Isabel. Um, yeah. <laughs> so let me share what uh, Harry is currently doing. Um, voila. And then, and, um, uh, if I'm correct, it's also in the chat, so you, you can yeah, uh, you can see the link in the chat and follow it uh, during uh, the talks. So currently, uh, Harry has uh, is is drawing, and you see it appear on the screen. Uh, and we have our nice first visualization of uh, what I said during the introduction, and uh, we see as it appears uh, what Vivi told about the Data Governments Act. Wow, looks stunning. Thank Great. you, Harry. Now we will jump to uh, our next speaker, uh, Isabel de Seer. Uh, Isabel is a medical doctor as well as a computer scientist with over 25 years of experience in healthcare IT, including data standards, big data, and digital health. Isabel is an active member of My Data and co-leading my data for pandemics as well as um, she's working on um, everything that's concerned with individual data profiles within the context of health isabel great that you could join us we're looking forward to your presentation and insights and the floor is yours Thank you, Rafa, and, and thank you for inviting me to this panel. I think it's it's great to see progress moving on something which I personally believe, and I think many of us believe it's extremely important, which is giving more power to the individual. And what I want to do today is to come in some concrete use case. I think we've been discussing, and Christian uh, Christoph made a fantastic presentation of the different aspects, and Vivi uh, went into the regulation. No, what would that mean from a practical perspective in a situation which is very close to all of us, which is pandemics? And so what I really want to go to discuss today is how we can come with problem-centric solutions that are powered by individual-centric data intermediary. And I want to take that in the case more specifically of responsible movement during the pandemics. And that's the work that we've been doing in the context of one of the my data pandemic uh, my data uh, thematic group which is my data uh, for pandemics so pandemics come and go experts expect more more contagious and more lethal outbreaks in the year to come so guys we are not at the end of this and so we need to to have scalable solution to manage those outbreaks more specifically um, in the context of this presentation, I'm going to talk about the problem of uh, responsible uh, uh, movement. What we want to do is to maximize responsible freedom of movement during pandemics or endemics before there is testing and vaccination while ensuring human rights are respected. Outside of break, we have normal freedom of movement. During an outbreak, as you know, we've been completely locked down. What we want to do is responsible movement. So, and those one would actually be, the, the, the rules around that would be scaled on uh, when the pandemic goes. But what is very important is that we scale, can scale it up when there is a new outbreak. No, responsible movement requires data and a lot of data and certainly personal data. During the COVID outbreak, there's been many breaches around data privacy. In April and March 2020, uh, journalists identified 34 countries with data privacy breach, and in some cases, very heavy. By the way, in Belgium, we are absolutely not better. On 12 February of this year, our government issued a law which 
It's basically it's in complete breach of data privacy, even in breach of what the WHO recommend. Uh, by law, in the Monitor Belge, the Belges tablet, um, the government has the possibility to combine identification, residency, employment, contact and travel data in the context of COVID without individual consents. By the way, COVID is expected to become an endemic and therefore that law will remain applicable for a long, long time. No, and, and I don't know how you feel about it, but I personally do not feel comfortable at all about that. No, let's dig down about the issue about uh, data and managing data in the context of pandemics. Today, and I think you mentioned that, Christoph, we are mostly able to work with population data, and therefore there is a lack of integration on different data sources at individual level, and we cannot really get good uh, actionable insight because we cannot segment at the individual level. And obviously working with population data, it's a balance between respect of human rights and the need to have access to the right data. Those issues derive from the lack of reliable infrastructure for sharing personal data and the lack of trust in institution holding those personal data. So we need to find other solution. Before looking at solution, let's look maybe again a little bit more in the problem. We have problem-centric approach to data today. We look at contact tracing, then we look at travel, then we'll look at vaccination. We all look at those things in silo and we collect data in silo. Those data uh, uh, needs to actually be anonymized if we want to look at population data. And if we want to integrate them, they are uh, still anonymized, but we have integrated data at population level, and we can put in the data commons a million of data from medical records and two, two million of location and at 100,000 about employment. So we don't really compare Apple and Apple, and it's very high quality, but that's what today the authority have got uh, for reporting. By the way, in that case, we as citizens are completely forgotten and very much frustrated, as I'm sure we all are in the context of the confinement as we have today. So summary, what we have today, multiple silo data, lack of interoperability, limited quality by bringing those data together, no information at the citizen level, or we need to infringe on data privacy. What is the suggestion that we have in my data by having that individual centric approach to data? thanks to data intermediaries or, 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 or my data operator or data cooperative, whatever we call it. Uh, let's, I will call it in the remainder of this call, a data intermediary. Isabel, so, yeah. um, your slides are not following. They are not. Are you in individual centric approach to data here? Or not? Which slide do yes. you see? Okay. okay. That's just my problem then. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, in the individual centric approach of my data, then we bring different data sources through a data intermediary with the permission of the individual into an individual problem oriented data profile for pandemics. It will be the data, the data we need for pandemics. That can, sorry, that can then, I'm sorry, I don't know, yeah, that can actually then be put together in a population data commons. And here we compare Apple and Apple. And it would be first pseudonymized because we need some pseudonymized data at the beginning, uh, certainly for a month or two. But there is no need to have them for all the time, as today the government in Belgium will do. You can, after a certain period of time, let's say two months, put that in data commons, and that is going to remain long term. With this, authority can have report of higher quality because the data are of higher quality and they could also have access for interim period to pseudonymized data. But mostly the individual is also going to have something out of it through different score in a digital wallet. And I'll come back to what would be that score in a minute. Now in this, with this approach, we can derive integrated problem oriented individual data profile Individuals are in control uh, uh, and can share their data interest, and they, they are incentivized to share the data to increase their freedom of movement, as I will show in a minute. Authorities have no need to do data privacy breaches as we do in Belgium. They have access to much higher quality data 
and therefore they can take adapted measure. Now, let's dig down in the minute in that score because what is the miracle here? Um, if you actually have access to individual data with the permission of the individual, you can actually go into segmentation and that would support granular lockdown before we even have tested our vaccine. You know, vaccine takes 12 to 18 months, so we want to have something before that. No, and that, that's the, an example of what you could do if you have those individual data profile. You can actually define rules, sorry, at the government level when you look at population level, you know, red, orange, green zone, or uh, addition, in addition to that, you have area risk level, again, red, orange, green. And then you can link that with patient data on the level of contagion or health. And based on those different elements of information, you can have different types of rules. Either if it's the, the kind of the red one, you need to stay home. If it's a dark orange, you can move on if it's critical and so on and so forth. So you can define different level of movement you can have based on your profile and your risk. And in that case, most of the people, certainly uh, in area like us, would be more in the light green and dark green that in the orange, so we would have much, much more freedom of movement. How will that practically happen? Because it's all nice and beautiful, but uh, that's where data intermediaries are so important. You certainly have heard about what is happening now around the digital green paths or the immunization paths or vaccination paths. Fundamentally, the idea is to bring together identity, lab test or vaccination test, store that information somewhere, and then out of that, with the permission of the individual, to derive a credential that you put in your digital wallet, and then you can go and travel. That would be a basic infrastructure that we would need for um, uh, uh, the digital green path. There are other technology, but data intermediary is definitely one. Outside of pandemics, then you can actually also, through data intermediary, have other services and manage your medical record, employment information, store that in personal data store like Solid uh, or other, but Solid is definitely an important one. Comes the pandemic, you can add new application like contact tracing, like self-assessment, and store that information again in your personal data store. With the permission of the individual, you can derive that individual pandemic data profile I was mentioning before. And with the segmentation call I show you, you can actually come with different score, which you can use for local transportation, to go to the football, to go to theater, to go to restaurant, um, if you can actually show that you have at no risk. And that can also, the information can also then be used in those population data common for reporting. So you can see with data intermediary, we can put in place solution that are much, much more uh, uh, correct for individual. And we really believe that there is no need to trade data privacy for the common goods as we are doing currently in Belgium. If citizens are in power, they can act responsibly and they can share their data in trust with authority to jointly work on the common goods. And I think it's for my data, it's absolutely critical. And with that, I really want to take uh, thanks the team, which um, we've been, uh, who's been working with it in the context of the thematic group. So Christoph and Raf, back to you. Isabel, thank you for this elo eloquent presentation uh, about the topic that uh, affects us all. Um, now I would like to uh, jump to uh, the panel. So during the, during the panel, uh, Matthias will be the man on the clock. Uh, Matthias, Matthias van Kompenmolen is a senior researcher at the Research Group for Media, Innovation and Communication Technologies at Ghent University and IMAX since uh, 2013. And he's involved in the Flemish Solid ecosystem. But before we dive into the panel, um, our colleagues asked me to give a, a brief overview of what's happening within uh, Belgium and also about the events of the Flemish region. Raf, I'm going to interrupt, but can you keep uh, the time <laughs> into account? We are running a schedule. I see that we are running, uh, yes. I'm looking, uh, yes, we are running six minutes uh, 
behind scheme, so I will limit it, uh, this little bridge to two minutes. So we all know that, um, uh, Christophe, can you share the slides uh, to support this uh, small uh, interludium? So thank you, Christophe. So we all know that uh, in September, uh, President von der Leyen uh, stated that uh, the State of the Union, she explained the importance of um, putting uh, users in control of their personal uh, data. Also, um, things about uh, personal data and personal data faults were in the Flemish coalition uh, agreement and also uh, the Minister President uh, Jan Jan Bon emphasized on putting citizens in control again in the September declaration. Um, I think since late uh, 2018, the Flemish government started experimenting with um, solid, so with um, a, a personal uh, data vault, you can call it an online memory stick for personal uh, data. And they did it uh, in the context of the Flemish citizen profile, where citizens can get access, access to their uh, government-owned data. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, there's also a pilot which runs into a, a sandbox uh, built on top of the citizen's profile, which allow to share data from uh, the public sector, so the data that the governance owns about it, put citizens in control to reuse it within other contexts, including the private context. The next step the Flemish uh, government did was to start up an ecosystem, an ecosystem with uh, public and private uh, partners involved, not limited uh, to, uh, to Flanders, where uh, they shared the different uh, use cases and we have many of them, uh, both from public and private sector, within uh, the context of health, um, GovTech, uh, the context of uh, mobility, as well as uh, media and culture. And there we see that the, the ecosystem uh, evolves and they're drawing a roadmap uh, together. So we see many, many uh, initiatives. But now let's jump to the panel discussion. Um, so we have a stunning panel. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Professor uh, Ruben Verborg, Professor of Decentralized Web Technology at the Internet Technology and Data Science Lab of Ghent University. Together with Sir Tim Berners-Lee, uh, Ruben is the driving force in the solid ecosystem uh, that gives you back control and choice, both online and offline. Also, I would like to uh, introduce Paul Teskes. Paul is uh, a mass ecosystem, is active in the mass ecosystem uh, development at the Department of uh, Mobility and uh, Openbare Werken. Uh, he's also a digital ecosystem uh, development architecture, working on digital transformation, digital marketing, digital analytics, big data, and involved in the My Data community. We ask him because he sticks out his entrepreneurial drive to make things happen in a collaborative way. Also, I would like to welcome uh, Malte Bayer Katzenberger. He's a policy officer at the European Commission. After Malte uh, have worked at the Academy of European Law, he joined the European uh, Commission, DigiConnect. He's working uh, on policy uh, related to data-driven innovation, including open data policy and aspects of data protection. And currently, he's involved in the free flow of data initiative. Now, the focus of our debate is how to uh, involve citizens, uh, because there is a regulation, Flemish government is investing, companies and startups are putting a lot of effort in setting up this uh, ecosystem. The debate will be uh, moderated by Christophe and uh, myself, and uh, Matthias will do the wrap-up. I would 
like to welcome uh, the panel and let's kick off the debate with a first question related to the data trust and data cooperative now sharing private data is about trust as we heard uh, from the previous uh, speakers now who do we trust and 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 uh, who do we confide not and how are we sure that our data and uh, our trust uh, will be not uh, abused and to put it differently how does the data trust manage conflicts of interest or income and um, how does this relate to uh, the uh, current uh, jurisdiction so to put it short how uh, do we keep on trusting the trust and i would like to kick off the debate with uh, some reflections of vivi thank you so much um i i love the the question of trust it's definitely one of those uh buzzwords almost that you you hear in in conversations uh around personal data and um i I wanted to share a thought that I found very helpful around uh, trust working since I work in a in a very global context. Um, I've I've proudly stolen this uh, from from a colleague, so not original to me, I promise. Um, but basically, the idea is is around trust traditions and how very different. Uh, communities, different um, people within those communities um, have different kinds of, of criteria for, for what and whom uh, they trust, right? And so, so my slightly counterintuitive answer to how do we trust is actually interoperability. Um, interoperability means that we have the choice to trust the kind of actor that we feel comfortable with. I, in Finland, I trust my bank to provide my, my login credentials. Other countries prefer to use their telcos, their um, their governments, um, or, or um, some sort of community managed um, systems. And I think that's a good thing. Plurality is a good thing. And the, the fact that um, these different systems could work together through interoperability uh, is actually what enables these different kinds of trust to, to flourish when it comes to, to personal data. So there's my, my thought there. Thank you, Vivi. Yes, interoperability is indeed uh, very crucial. And I'm curious about uh, the insights about this topic uh, from uh, Malta. Yes, good, good morning to all uh, and thank you for, for having me on this panel. I've been following my data since I read the paper I think in 2015 and have seen the organization grow and happy to see some known faces here and in, in the call. I should also say that uh, well, I'm probably one of the drivers to get the My Data approach into the Data Governance Act, which is the legislative proposal that Vivi so uh, um, perfectly presented early on, which really offloads a bit of task of here. And I'm, I'm so to say also a My Data ambassador within the organization. And uh, uh, that, that, that's something which is not an easy task for many people out there. This, this topic is still quite futuristic. And, and I think events like these help to understand this, the benefits. And I was particularly also intrigued by Isabel's presentations on this one. The inspiration um, uh, in, in Article 9 and 11 of the proposal is actually uh, to drive trust in, in novel data intermediaries. It has been uh, modeled around some of the known business and architectural models that we, we knew. And it certainly goes by a, a, a certain division of labor, or if you want, separation of functions. So that we we see if you take now the, the solid initiative as, as one model that the pods are the infrastructure and services should wrap around this infrastructure and there's other startups in europe that have been trying to to build this now for some years with the evident problem of rolling it out to a mass market in the absence of a big marketing budget or a big partner in this and that's maybe also one of the things we can look at here in this panel um, but the trust in, in the in the regulation as we have designed it should uh, come mainly from the separation of functions and roles. 
that you are uh, not able to well combine services on top of the data directly with the provision of the of the infrastructure and this is a message i would say also to big tech companies who love vertical integration and build uh, really big empires around integrating everything into a very convenient ecosystem uh, and it basically says we, if we want if we mean human centricity and uh, control we need to 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 bring out these functions as we also have to bring out e-identity out of, of ecosystems and make them self-standing services in the data economy. And then the services that build on e-identification and on personal data wallets can come on top. What we now, the, the second distinction I think that we make is between these individualistic type of approaches and the community-based approaches uh, that we, we heard from Christoph in the beginning, the cooperatives. And here, I think uh, th this, if the pods are futuristic, uh, the cooperatives are even more futuristic uh, for, for many decision makers. And that's a problem also when you, when you discuss legislation. Uh, but we, we certainly understand that for many, many contexts, community decisions are much more appropriate on data. So we have basically have a place in the Data Governance Act for a level playing field regulation on cooperatives, but knowing also that a lot of things have to be worked out. How are they established? What's the internal governments? And certainly, and that's my last point, what can the cooperative do on behalf of the individual and what rights remain your individual rights? And that's, that's I think, there's still a frontier to decide what rights I can exercise, even if the majority in the cooperative decides to do A, can I still have a right to say, no, I don't follow the majority vote here and I can still do whatever I wanted uh, on an individual data question. These are maybe the broad level question that we still need to figure out. And really last point, uh, also invitation to, to Raf and, and colleagues at Innovasi Flanders to influence the Belgian position on the politics because this, this is, the regulation is moving really now. And we certainly welcome also the idea to work on interoperability as a criterion, as, as Vivi said, and so we, we also hear we need maybe a member state or a member of parliament to bring this to the process. The file has basically lost our control. We are accompanying the DGA file in the, in the legislative process, but we, we need initiatives from, from the countries to bring uh, any modification to the table. And I think proactive uh, work is needed because this, fast, this file really moves along very fast and we should have the right regulation for, for my data. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Malta. Uh, and, and actually mentioning that indeed that, that the, the cooperative that is still more futuristic uh, than uh, the idea of, of, of personal data control. Uh, and I would like to direct my next question to Isabel. Uh, if we start now, uh, today, founding uh, such a cooperative, which should be the first, let's say, baby steps uh, we should take uh, as logical first steps, because given that you already have experience with building this uh, COVID uh, applied uh, mechanism, uh, if, if we want to put it a bit broader or put it in operation, which are the first steps? You're still muted, Isabel. Thanks. Thank you, Christophe. And, and just to put it straight, uh, it's not yet in place. and. Um, I think we're really um, trying to put all those different steps to make sure it is going to happen and working on the next pandemic preparedness. No, I think the first step for me is education. Frankly, the problem is not so much about available technology. Yes, solid is not yet completely there. Yes, data intermediary are not completely there, my data operator, but there are still uh, there's quite a lot of component available. The problem is lack of understanding. What I explained to you, I don't think it's clear for many people, certain decision maker, because you need a certain amount of data literacy. And I always love, Ruben, when you make your presentation as well, because it is so clear that we need to do things differently with the data. And that needs to be more decision maker will. And I'm not just going to say authorities. It's, it's everybody who has to take this decision. So the first thing is education on what can be done differently with the data we have today. It goes that it's what's going to drive um, having the, the money is simply to actually do this. The second thing I believe we need to do is really to actually show it, so it can work and how it can work and develop pilots. Um, and then um, obviously for me, the, the third point is further supporting what we are doing in my data with the my data operator and make sure it is happening. And by the way, it is happening. 
um, if you look at the MADATA operator, it's not that much futuristic anymore, Malta, I believe. Yes, it's not perfect, but there are solutions that are already in place and Paul is pushing very much on, on mobility and pushing on, on, on pandemics. Um, we have to keep all of people believing and, and, and pushing and, and, and Ruben is pushing us on it. Let's keep doing it and show it can be done. It's more a will than the technology. Thank you. Isabel. Thank you, Isabel. And uh, yes, we can. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, I was wondering, and also when, when uh, Christophe was, uh, was asking his question, what is the biggest uh, opportunity? And Ruben, what do you think is, is the biggest uh, opportunity in uh, this context? And how can we evolve the, the different players uh, in the uh, ecosystem? Ruby, I think you're still on mute. Yep. Just one two? Yes. Okay. Well, I think the biggest opportunity is in tackling use cases that have benefits on both sides. Like, and I think so far we might have been talking about too much one-sided about the problem. Like, okay, sure, like personal data should start from the individual. I'm on board with that. However, um, we need use cases with benefits for both sides. Like we need use cases where companies today also have a problem. Um, and, and, and that's how it works because we shouldn't be too naive about any of this. None of it will work if it's not a decent economic model behind all of this. And, and the, so as far as it comes to data organization, a focus on the individual, yes, that makes a lot of sense. But when it comes to solutions, we need to look at both sides and all sides of the story are not going to get anywhere. So the opportunities to me are concrete use cases where we can, can make a difference. And there's, there's plenty of them. I mean, just to start with one that we use um, every day, for instance, supermarkets, right? Like it's, it, it's very one side at the moment. Like my supermarket collects data about me and, and they use it. Well, actually, if I have the data of all the shopping I do online and offline, and if I'm willing to share that with different parties, there might be more in it for me, for instance. They win because they have more data that helps them to get, get insights. Um, and I win because they might give me better deals. And it's these use cases, these opportunities that excite me, where there's a win for multiple parties uh, on, on different sides. Thank you, Ruben, for this insight. I also was, was wondering, uh, as uh, Paul is an ecosystem uh, expert, what his thoughts are on this matter. Yes, I agree fully with what uh, what Ruben says. There's two sides uh, that need to have benefits in this story. And uh, as a digital transformation consultant, and as we see on the internet, uh, focusing on the user problems is always at the highest pain points. Discovering in the customer journey the pain points of the individual is key to what we do. But of course, you need to recognize uh, from the other side the pain points that you can solve and what business this generates. For instance, in Finland, they implemented one of the first um, HR, um, my data operator models, and it, they saved on a societal basis. They saved 100 million uh, euros in um, uh, optimizing the processes of finding workers uh, for construction and finding IT specialists um, um, for Finland, which has a shortage and uh, of that kind of uh, skilled workers. So we have to look at it from a society. You have to look at it from benefits that we can generate, but still keep the focus, as Isabel also said, on the individual and the pain points. And digital transformation is all about users and finding the business cases that evolve around that. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Now, so, uh, Christophe, sorry, uh, sometimes, um, sometimes we hear something about monetization and data. I'm sure you have a good question in my mind about this topic. <laughs> yeah, and actually, I'm, I'm quite happy that indeed uh, Ruben already mentioned it, that indeed it is uh, both sides and, and finding the win. And, and uh, I already talked with one of the supermarkets and they were very eager to get more data. They were not so eager to uh, share their data, but it, it's uh, kind of that problem currently going on. Uh, but also towards Paul and, and Ruben and maybe the others uh, to have a uh, coining in on that. Should we follow the money and, and uh, should we indeed uh, monetize a, a data trust that we organize a, as a common 
products? And if so, what would be a, a viable business model for a, a data columns, commons? And if not, if you think it's only uh, non-monetary uh, gains, why should we not uh, follow the money in this sense? Uh, maybe Paul first. Yes, this is this has been a big discussion and also in the my data community about monetizing or not. That is uh, something we have discussed uh, very lengthy and is still going on the discussion. And personally, I don't really believe that we have to monetize what we call uh, currency or uh, GDP value or any of that, but that we should look at the economic value of what we're doing here. And in the economic value today, um, all of us know that we have uh, sustainable development goals and that the UN has brought forward and also in Europe we have a number of goals that we are aiming climate goals we have uh, sustainable goals that all of our communities local and um, in Flanders are looking at and there I think we can connect to the societal and the uh, universal development goals that we are we all have and this is about uh, poverty this is about energy and so from the my data if you look at digital transformation from the user we have been looking at um, the average family spending on a yearly basis. What does this go to? This goes to energy, for instance. So if we can automate energy, um, both as a service provider and as an individual, this can save a lot of money. And I think there we have to find some of the societal business cases. There's been estimates by McKinsey and, and some of the other consultancies that estimate um, a 4% GDP business case for societal goals of automating low income energy providing automating that so using data sharing of your uh, local energy and focusing on the family budget and the big uh, post in that family budget and that's where i believe that my data and um, personal data management we can be kind of the waste managers of eliminating waste in our society which is now still in manual people low income people who don't open up their letters don't pay utility this is waste that is now in the market that shouldn't be there and that's what i believe we should be aiming at so um, if i grasp it correctly it's like okay not necessarily following a, a profit model but following a, a gains model and a savings model uh for uh the benefit of society uh, maybe if somebody else uh, wants to chime in or has, has a different opinion on this. Um, Christophe, if I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Vivi. Okay, Vivi, maybe you first, and then uh, I'll give the word to Isabel for a few minutes. Okay, uh, thanks. Yeah, so like Paul mentioned, like this is a this is a hot topic of conversation in the in the MyData community, and the uh, MyData as such um, doesn't have a, a position. Uh, on this, uh, there are, are good arguments here and there. I'd, I'd maybe want to like put it into some context, which I find helpful in thinking about this. So if we talk about direct monetization of personal data, that's um, that basically the argument for that is to increase individuals' participation in the market right? Uh, they they get monetary value from, from the personal data, they get a, a kind of like a slice of the pie, um, so to speak. Um, but the alternative uh, where we think about um, people's participation and empowerment in kind of a broader sense than just the market uh, is when we think about people as as civic beings, as as citizens, as as um, um, as uh, like holistic beings with other um, kind of aspects that are important to them apart from the economic one, then I think the monetization question kind of shrivels away, and you kind of end up putting human like fundamental human rights and and exercise of those and empowerment through that at like front and center. And I find this kind of more holistic idea of, of participation in, in the democracies that we live in, um, as well as the markets, as well as other aspects, a very compelling way to look at it. Um, so I find the, the kind of monetization question often narrows the focus too much into merely the economic sphere which is while important not the only sphere relevant okay thank you uh vivi 
Uh, Isabel, you wanted to uh, yeah, chime a in? Quick, a quick one. Being in healthcare, data of huge value. Just the market of healthcare for pharma is more than three billion in, uh, per year and growing every year. So I think there is value in data and they need to be in some shape or form transform in something valuable. But I agree, and I think somebody in this, the, the chat said, it's more than money. I completely agree, it should not be money, it should be valorization of type of reward. And that's where we can find a new economy. And again, if you look at health, um, if you share your data, you could have a decreased insurance premium, or you could have faster access to a clinical trial because you share your data and you can have a better treatment. So I think this is towards that um, type of new economy and new type of services we need to look. But to say no, we want we don't want data monetization because it does not have a nice flavor. I think it's just then leaving the room for people, other people, to make money out of our data, and I don't think that's acceptable. Okay, thank you. And uh, maybe Rafa uh, to go for the the, the final question. Well, I, I think this is a very interesting uh, topic, and uh, I think I skipped the last question, and I would like to uh, hear Malta's thoughts on this. Uh, topic about monetization. Uh, no, thanks a lot. I, I fully subscribe to what has been said before. It's about saving friction. It's about use cases that give you val value. The one thing I wanted to um, chip in on this is actually the function of the cooperative approach. Because first for most, I think the cooperative should solve the problem of um, me not being alone with my data because my data may be also other people's data, either indirectly or even directly. So that's that's maybe the first reason to have a, a more collective governance around certain data assets. But it begs the question, if you form certain cooperatives around the idea that they could influence the bargaining power of the individuals or even small single person or even micro companies within the cooperatives, uh, like the good old um, credit unions or farming societies or even um, book clubs where you basically aggregate purchase power and get nicer books at a, at a cheaper price. I, I, it begs the question whether this could also kind of recalibrate a, the current imbalance in the bargaining power. I'm not saying that people should have a, a direct monetary revenue, but that's maybe one aspect where, the, where also the cooperatives could become an interesting model. I'm not saying it should be the first, the 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 the, the main model. Uh, I'm more thinking that it's it's the friction cost for individuals and organizations, as Ruben said, that we should bring down with these personal data infrastructure. And maybe one interesting aspect that I want to explore next week with colleagues actually is at Irish Life. Uh, Irish Life is a, uh, obviously a life insurance. Uh, and they uh, want to roll out also some sort of pod infrastructure in Ireland because the onboarding process for a lot of companies is, is very costly. It's very paper-based and they, they seem to have an interest to also bring down onboarding costs for companies. That's where you can have also a lot of wins uh, in terms of, of digitization and providing then the digital infrastructure for individuals. Thank you, uh, Malte. Ruben, do you have any concluding thoughts uh, as we came to the end of uh, the, the debate on this uh, topic? Yeah, I would say that multiple stakeholders need to be part of this. Like, this is, is to, to me the key. Like, If we want use cases to be successful, um, we need to look at it from, from the multiple sides. I think that this is a key issue because data means something different to, to different parties. That is it's very obvious. Um, and we need to get them aligned. And ultimately, what companies really want is not to just have our data. They want to innovate. They want to deliver good services and so on. So I think the misconception today is that in order to do those things, you need to start harvesting the data yourself. But once companies realize, no, wait a minute, actually, I just need to use the data. Like, I don't need any sort of possession over it, basically, that things can, can, can get rolling. So uh, my concluding remark here is that from the get-go, let's involve all of the stakeholders to see, okay, what will be it for you? What will be it for you? Because this is a story where multiple parties will win. I'm really convinced of that. So let's involve them all from the start. That's my main takeaway. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ruben, for these concluding thoughts. I see it's uh, 10 past 11. And I would like to give uh, the floor to Matthias for a wrap up. And I would like to thank uh, the panel for the stunning insights. Also, I would like to ask Christophe whether we could share uh, the uh, Harry's uh, whiteboard because I'm curious on uh, his 
to see his artwork and I saw already saw many snapshots on Twitter. So Matthias, the floor is yours. Ari, I'm looking forward to uh, your whiteboard. Wow. Okay, this looks very nice. Uh, I want to come in uh, to share my webcam, but I have issues with that, so I'm sorry. Uh, I, I dressed with my best shirt today, um, but it will be without a webcam. Um, first of all, thank you for the panel, for your input and for your presence here today. Uh, and Harry, um, I will. I don't know if you want to speak uh, for the for the rest of the audience, or will your picture speak for itself? Hari, you're still on mute, I think. Uh, Hari, I think you're still on mute. Okay, this doesn't seem to work, Harry, but uh, anyway, yeah. Well, um, uh, I would say let's focus uh, on the picture while I'll just make a short wrap up of the debate. Um, uh, so we started with the question of, uh, yeah, there's a lot about trust and do we, can we trust the trust uh, as a citizen or as from a societal perspective? Um, and uh, Vivi came up with like uh, an, an idea of, yeah, we have to uh, think maybe uh, or, or put a lens on as a society from uh, previous trust traditions and people use different criteria uh, when they trust each other or um, other actors and interoperability is a solution and it means that we can have the choice to choose the actor we trust. Malta uh, also gave like another um, uh, input and I think we should take that into account because it's open Belgium today uh, that the, the Flemish region here in Belgium is doing a great job we are a front runner in the world I think uh, we can say that uh, out loud but we also have to focus on the uh, Belgian federal level as well um, because uh, new regulations uh, will work on that uh, level um, then yeah there was a question where do we start uh, we know that we, we need to, we want to take some steps and uh, how can we do that? Um, uh, first of all, we need to educate ourselves, we need to make sure that people understand um, uh, what we're talking about. It's about data literacy. We also need to have the skills, for example, to go to, to, to get along with this huge amount of data. We have to show it, how it can work, so we have to showcase. Uh, and we have to uh, also support things like my data operators um, and so on. Then there was like, okay, we have the where, where do we start question. The next question was like, okay, how, what, is the, what are the opportunities? How, if, you, if we have to start then, uh, what is the, the thing we need to, to count? And Ruben came up with, uh, it's not just, um, as you call it in Dutch, vrehit uh, or like just a, a happy, happy thought. Uh, if you want to succeed this, we need also to focus and, and to accept that there's a need of a decent economical model. Um, uh, and that's where we, we have to take that into account. Um, so, and that is where we came up with the last question. And our main, I think, main, main, main point of the discussion was, yeah, should it be monetized? How can we get along with that? Should we look at the real profits of companies or more like societal gains in terms of savings, um, efficiency, uh, benefits? Um, it's still an open discussion. We are still at the beginning of this general societal process. And I also want to thank Franz, uh, who mentioned in the chat that uh, we need also to focus on power relations. And I think that's a very good um, uh, insight because we are living today in a network society. So everything is combined uh, with each other. The idea of um, uh, personal data is uh, de facto uh, actually a data exchange ID. So we, we are dependent from each other. So we also need to focus on that power relations. Uh, if you want to uh, succeed, we also have to take that into account that we have a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, environment where we are uh, in. And these are my last uh, words uh, from the conclusions. Thank you, Matthias, uh, for the wrap up. 
uh, I would like to uh, thank all speakers and panelists. It was a stunning mix. I would like to thank uh, Isabel, Ruben, Vivi, Malte, uh, Matthias, Christophe and Paul and also Harry for his uh, artwork. I don't know, Christophe, if we can, before we, uh, we uh, end this session, have a, again a quick view on uh, Harry's whiteboard. Yeah, I'll immediately uh, give the view and uh, in the meanwhile, I'll, I'll take the time to announce that if you want to uh, continue thinking with uh, on this topic and forming this uh, data collaborative and make this uh, a reality, then uh, please reach out to any of us. Uh, we are reachable uh, on many online platforms and uh, uh, I'll share also at least my email and uh, other of the organizers could do so. So we can stay in touch and uh, think about the next steps to uh, make this uh, for at least Europe uh, a far reality coming closer to the nearer future. Thank you, Christophe. And also to end, I would like uh, to thank uh, Open Knowledge Belgium for giving us this opportunity, this platform to share this innovative thoughts and also many thanks to Astrid for uh, supporting this session. Thank you all. Looking forward to, forward to see you in the near future. Thank you. Everyone and welcome to Open